to talk about Persia. There is this poem that we have, it's by Baba Tahir. I think it's something that you guys will eventually um, listen to in one of the modules for one of the weeks. Baba Tahir lived in Hamadan. You guys don't need to know, and this is ridiculous information I'm sharing with you. It used to be very, very cold, and he was a 12-year-old kid. And it's a very religious community or city. And so one day he goes to the mosque or the church or the synagogue, but for him it's a mosque, and looks at the guy who is giving a sermon and says, how can I have access to the truth? It's a 12-year-old kid. And oftentimes, kids don't really know what they're talking about. I remember when I was a kid, I looked at my grandfather and I said, so, you know, Grandpa, how old are you? So I'm 60. Oh, so you're going to die soon. So old age equals death. Hello, Russell. <clears throat> and so, you know, I couldn't really appreciate uh, or understand the gravity of my statements or comments, but that's what kids do. And so... The guy at the pulpit takes his question relatively seriously, at the same time sarcastically, and says to him that since you're so young, only 12, the easiest way, the shortest path to God or truth is for you to go and sit in the middle of the snow and pray. And <coughs> make sure that you pray in a very sincere way. And you will know how sincere you are if the snow around you is melting. Because usually when you pray, and you pray in the right way, your body generates a good amount of heat. Because within the context of prayer, what you have is longing. You have yearning. You have anxiety. You have dread. You have confusion. That generates a good amount of emotions inside you. And so the kid actually believed what he was hearing. So he goes one night around midnight, and it's Hamadan, gets really, really cold. It's like Lake Tahoe. Everything just gets frozen. He sits on this pool of ice and begins to pray. I want the truth. I want the truth. I want the truth. And then he sees that the ice around him is melting. <clears throat> and then... You know, he increases the fasting, the praying, all that stuff, and eventually becomes one of the sages of the Persian culture. And he was named Baba Tahir. Baba in Persian, Persian means father. You know, it's kind of like uh, hope. It comes from the word Papa, which means father. It's kind of like the Pope replaces Jesus Christ. He is now... <coughs> The, the mother or the father of all humanity. So that's what father means. And the last name is Tahir. Tahir means clean or pure. And so this man wrote a poem, and it goes kind of like this. Guli ke khum bedadum picho tabish, ze'ab didagunum dadum abish, bedargah elahi ke rababi. So let's put that within the context of becoming a mother and having a son and then slowly seeing what happens to your kid. The fears imposed upon you by society, what you see, the dreams and hopes that every parent has for their kids and slowly watching their dreams wither away because life is very, 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 very cruel. Gol means flower. Khom means me, my flower. Guli ki khom bedadam. Pichotabish. Pichotab means... If you look at a flower, it has a good amount of curves to it, or a stem, you know. That when you see a human being, when you see a child, this child has parents, and the parents have no choice but to see 
all the turns and twists that this child has to go through to reach maturity or adulthood. And the only way that this kid can actually reach adulthood is what do flowers need to grow? They need water, right? And so <coughs> if you want to know how children are protected, cared for, grown in the cradle of their parents is that it's, it's a bloody job. You cry all the time, you worry all the time, you're anxious. You know, you don't know if they come home, they're going to have clean language. If they're going to come home and ask, mom, what's sex? Mom, what's porn? Mom, what's transgender? Mom, what's this? Mom, what's that? Because all these concepts, it's like a hammer hitting the child's psyche, cracking it open. And then you have more and more innocence being stolen or being lost, you know. Because you, they're getting exposed to things they're not ready for. I'm not really quite sure at what stage human beings are ready for, you know, what society exposes them to. So let's just focus on these two lines and then we'll go to the next two. So a mother looks at you and says, you know, you're 18 or 19 or 20 or 35. Or 10. Do you know how you made it this far? And the child says, I drank a lot of milk and cereal and chicken and says, no, 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 no. Those are all byproducts. I raised you with the tears of my eyes and the blood and the sweat of my heart. I raised you uh, through my imaginations and my care and forgiveness. And I put my life on pause so you could get to be 10 and 12 and 14 or 15 or 20. I became content with having a slice of bread so I could take you to Target so you could buy your favorite toys, i.e. you are where you are in life because of the sacrifices I made, your father made, your mother made, your sisters made. And if you happen to live in a village, you are the way you are because of the sacrifices of your village. <clears throat> you know, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon. I mean, Russell knows this better than I, that you come home, it's been an exhausting day, you want to turn on the TV and just have a mind-numbing experience, just rest for about two hours. But then your kids are running around. And you want to watch maybe Sopranos, you know, or some show. And you realize there is a good amount of sex scenes. There's a good amount of profanity. There's a good amount of violence. And then if you happen to be a relatively mindful parent, you say, I don't really want my kids to be exposed to that stuff just yet. So, and you're exhausted and you don't want to go to sleep and you don't want to watch this particular show, so you turn off the movie and you tell the kids, let's go for a walk or something. I mean, these are sacrifices that parents have to make, and they're real, and they're, they're tough, man. They're tough. And the kids are unaware. I mean, the kids really, really don't understand. And the truth is, none of us understand what it means to be a parent. None of you understand what it means to stand here. I mean, I am okay because, you know, I'm to some extent seasoned. But if I were just coming to class, spitting out information, regurgitating, just and not caring for the information, I was just a mouthpiece. Uh, if I was that kind of instructor and if my students were to fall asleep or have the look of boredom on their face, I would look at them and say, you know, just wait until you become a teacher. And then you try to like educate people or at least make them interesting with a certain idea. And then you fall, you see them fall asleep and <coughs> you don't know what to do with them. Kick them, slap them, just don't look their way. It's excruciating in many ways, do you see. And the point I'm trying to make for those of you who want to understand how it feels to be or what it means to have a drunk father or what it means to have a friend who's been abused or who has felt abandonment or uh, a father or mother is driving you to school, looks at you and says, so son or daughter, you know, when you finish Laney College, are you going to NYU? And if you do go to NYU, are you ever going to call me? 
are you ever going to come and visit? Are you ever going to like show up to Thanksgiving or Christmas or any of those, you know, holidays? And in your head, in your imagination as a young adult, you say to yourself, mom, dad, you know, I've been living with you guys for 18 long years. It feels like eternity. You know, I have lived under your roof. I've li lived under your laws, you know. Uh, and you guys, you're nice people, but sometimes you're like a tyrant. You know, I want to go to NYU. I just want to run away and just experience independence, freedom. Um, and, you know, no matter how much your parents tell you, you will never get it. And then the only way you can really understand what you put your parents through, the worries, the sacrifices, is for you to become a child. I mean, to become a parent. Now, you won't get what it means to be a parent. Once in a while, as your own child begins to scream, uh, begins to throw temper tantrums, and as you realize that all of a sudden you came home in a good mood, you're relatively healthy, you have a good amount of energy, but the constant screaming has pushed you into poverty. Now, you know, the good mood goes away and is replaced by bad mood. Now you're frustrated. Now you're confused. Now you're angry. And these are emotions that make you poor. Poor in the sense that you don't have control over your environment, not over your emotions, not over your physical environment. Your wife or your husband may say, what's going on? Then you say, shut up, you know, and then you don't know how to treat your kid. You know, we went out a couple nights ago, um, and this mom was picking up her kid from this ballet class. And uh, man, this kid, she was maybe three or four. She was screaming. And there came a point, this mom, she was about maybe 38, 39. She sat in the middle of the street and she started crying. She couldn't control this child. You know, and remember, all of us have... A certain capacity to us. Russell has a capacity of a gallon. I have a capacity of 16 ounces. You have a capacity of two ounces. So if you go over that capacity, I'm going to explode. You know, the good thing about Russell is that one gallon, you can put a lot of garbage in it. 16 ounces, not very much. Two ounces, nothing at all. So this mom had reached, you know, her capacity and she couldn't do anything. And so we were watching a couple of nannies went to her and said, you know, and I was curious as to what was happening. So my son and I went over there. We just sat there, you know, gossip, eavesdrop. And a couple of nannies went to her and said, you know, this is our job. Do you want any help? And she said, please, yes. And then, you know, they put her in the car. And the mom stood up, thanked these two young women, went to close the door. And this three-year-old kid puts her hand out. And the mom says, let me close the door. If I close it on your hand. It's going to break. You're going to be in a lot of pain. And the kid wouldn't listen. For the next 15 minutes, they would go back and forth. And he can't reason with a four-year-old. And again, the mom sat screaming. And eventually, you know, uh, we left. I don't, I'm not quite sure what happened. And the point, I suppose, is that you will never know the anguish that lives inside this, this you know, this mother um, until you become a parent yourself. Um, I mean, I know that we spoke about abandonment the other day in this class, and it's something you've experienced. It's something that's like a knife that has hit, cut through your meat and hit the bone, and it's really, really painful. And you say to yourself, um, if I ever have a child, if I ever have anyone depend on me, I will never abandon them. Well, in theory, it sounds really, really, really good. You know, in theory, all of us in this class are messiahs and saints and philosophers. In application, the story is very, very different because life is frustrating. You know, it puts you in certain difficult spots where you have no idea if it's day or night. You know, if you don't know if you're crazy, if you're sane. Um, and so, so that's... One thing you need to understand that despite your best attempt to put yourself in your parents' shoes to figure out what they're going through, it's nearly an impossible task. It really, really is. You know, as it is for me when I have some students who say, I smoke, you know, every single day because, you know, of my past. Then the next thing for me is, well, do I really want to go there? Ask them about their past. 
or someone says, I don't know if I'm a man or a woman, maybe I'm a divine. You know, these are just confusing moments that all of us have to go through. It matters very little uh, what you're confused about. What matters is you just confuse, and confusion, depending on its intensity and depth, it is painful, you know, because confusion that creates a good amount of pain pushes, it pushes you into this island, and you look around, no one is there except you. And it's tough. Now, when a mother asks an 18 or a 17 year old, are you gonna come back? What in essence a parent is saying, you know you're 18 because I put my life on pause for 18 years. I didn't wanna marry this guy, I did for your sake. I didn't wanna tolerate and endure his abuse, but I did because of your sake. I didn't wanna work, but I did for your sake so you can have extra this and extra that. And what she's saying, you're raised with the tears of my heart. You know. The very fact that you guys have made this sacrifice to come to this class this morning, that you woke up early, you took a shower, despite perhaps your messy life, despite perhaps some of you being depressed, uh, just being in a bad mood, being in a rough place in life, you take the trouble you know, to clean up and to come to class and sit there very dignified, respectfully, and despite all the nonsense I throw at your side, uh, you take everything in stride. You know, you don't retaliate in a mean-spirited way. For that, you know, I am grateful. And then what I don't see is that students really make a good amount of sacrifice coming to class and sit without complaining too much. And if they want to complain, they raise their hand and they put their complaint <coughs> in a very dignified, mature questions, you know. The next part of the poem is Is it really fair? To translate crudely, is it fair? That I have put my life into this kid. And you know who benefits from the life I have created? Pete's Coffee, the manager, capitalism, consumerism, AT&T, advertisement that pushes itself into my child's psyche. And my child all of a sudden becomes addicted to porn, addicted to drugs, addicted to foul language, gets into a gang, whatever the case may be, you know? And it's a really, really heart-wrenching place to be as a parent, that I do all the stuff, all make sacrifices, and eventually society takes my kid, chews it, and then spits it out. And then the child comes home. And what do I find? Nothing. He's homeless, he's bankrupt, he's gone mentally ill. There are so many issues that this kid now has. When I had the kid, he was perfectly fine. The moment this kid is stolen from me by society, he comes back with all sorts of difficulties. No. So, uh, you know, it's kind of like when you guys write an essay. It may be two pages, it may be a paragraph, but you have your soul inside this essay. You know, and I read it. And my comment, my feedback is, you were supposed to do three videos. He didn't answer any of the questions. And he said, come on, man, I put everything I had in the paragraph. Can't you read between the lines? I put my soul in there, you know? And that's just the way things are, you know? Uh, I think you have to be profoundly mindful, observant, aware of what makes a life worth living, what makes a relatively happy and healthy life. So you can appreciate it as well as appreciating those who have provided you the environment where you could kind of just live in that particular fashion. It's, it's tough being a parent. It's not like 50 or 100 years ago, man. You know, 50 years ago, your kids could just walk the streets. You wouldn't worry. You know, we didn't have front door locks up to the 1960s or maybe early 70s. 
No one needed to lock their doors. Cities were small, everybody knew everybody. There were no backyards, only front yards. So, and you were quite neighborly. You know, today that's, that's gone. So you have a lot of forces, you know, uh, that are in the way of raising a relatively good kids, staying healthy, you know, all those things. So if I was you, next time my mom asked me or any of you, yeah, I'm going to call every single day. I'm 60. I call my mom every day. And then I say, is dad around? That's, uh, that's a little tough because my dad will, you know, keep me on the phone for like two hours because he wants to talk about politics. And then I say, dad, I'm really sorry, my bladder, I call you soon. You know, and then he has to wait till the following day. But that's, you know. Yeah. So, uh, anyone else before we talk about something, Russell, less fun? Alex? What is it? I don't know. Um, I don't know what the question was. Anyone else before I just do something? Probably nothing. Kaya? Fair? Okay. So let's talk about the concept of fairness. Uh, I'm not going to make this political. I'm not going to make this social. I'm going to make this within the context of this class. Okay? That we have about 15 students in this room. And there is one man here, that's me, governing, or at least strong to govern this class, strong to make the ideas interesting. All right. So remember, this is not about fairness in regards to race, gender, economic, none of those things. Let's first of all talk about the very obvious. You're 18. I'm 60. Which means that I have 40 years over you. Is that fair? The answer is no. It means that I have been 18, and I know what it means to be 18. I have not forgotten. I know what I put my parents through. And now at the age of 60, I can tell you that almost 95% of the things they told me were true. But when I was 18, I didn't understand. <clears throat> so the obvious is this is a very unfair environment. That you're 18, I'm 60. Okay. Which means that as someone who has 40 years over you, which means I have an extra 40 years of experience, I have things to give you. But you're not going to receive them well. That's not fair on my part. Okay? So the very environment creates unfairness. I am a seller, you are a customer, but you don't want to receive. And upon not receiving what I want to give you, you frustrate me. And then you disappoint me. And then I move into anger. And then instead of expressing my anger physically, I express it by becoming slowly indifferent. Which means what? I come here every Tuesday and Thursday strong to express or share with you 40, 50, 60 years of experience but you don't care. So the only way I can cope with this unfairness, I won't care for you. 
Is that going to be fair for you? No, because you want to be cared for. You want to be respected. Okay. Now, every single one of you in this class have entered in this room with your own experiences. Those experiences create prejudice. Those experiences create bias. Those experiences create a castle in which you live. And the door is shut. I can't walk into it. If you go back to the question that was asked on Thursday about abandonment, imagine that I was to say to you, I have a solution to the problem of abandonment. And you say, what is it? Why don't you come to my office every single day? Bring me coffee. I'm there from 5.30 in the morning until just before my class around 9. Come there. If I come there, what am I going to do? Just come there and sit. I'll give you a book to read. You can just sleep. Just come there. And the person is going to say, well, that sounds crazy. Why the hell am I going to wake up at 5.30 in the morning, spend my money on a guy I don't even know, go to his office, and just sit there? I don't want to talk to him. I don't want to ask him any questions. I'd rather just sleep in my own bed. Why the would I want to spend my money on a stranger? And I say to this person, listen, I know what you're thinking. I'm going to give you an environment that's going to be comfortable, stable, non-threatening. And when you come there on a regular basis, it'll feel like home. I have a home. I know you have a home. You have a physical home, not a psychological home, not an emotional home. Come to my office. Well, how many days a week? Every single day. And then something strange is going to happen. When they come there every day, uh, Friday comes, I won't be on campus. Saturday, I won't be on campus. Sunday, I won't be on campus. And they say, well, what am I going to do Friday, Saturday, Sunday? Well, I'm not on campus, so I'll see you on Monday. They say, well, are you abandoning me? I'm not abandoning you. Just come on Monday. I have family. I have, you know, some things to do on my own. And all of a sudden, they take their assumptions back in time. Well, this is exactly what A, B, C, D did to my, you know, they gave me a home and they, they took that home away from me. I'm not taking anything away. I'm just saying, just let's put this on pause for three days. I'll be back. Let's just say they're, they're okay with that. Then they come to me and say, you know, I'm, I'm, having, I'm having these feelings and emotions. I'm not really quite sure if they're appropriate. What is it? You know, when I'm not here, I feel as if there is no place for me to go. And I say, well, this is the first time you're feeling that a place has become your home. Yeah, but I don't like it. Why? Because what if it shatters? I'm beginning to like this place, love this place, you know, rest in this place, have faith in this place, trust this place. But I also know that I've trusted before and it's been broken. You see, I have to compete with all these past experiences. Is it fair? It's not fair to the person who has this past experience, and it's not fair to me who's strong to create a new environment. So the first thing you need to understand about life is that there is nothing about life that speaks of fairness. Nothing. Is it fair that you're born black in America? No. Is it fair that 9-11 happened, that for the rest of my life they're going to look at me as a potential terrorist? No. Is it fair that you were born a girl but you feel like a boy? No. There is nothing about life that's fair. Is it fair that you got crummy parents? No. Okay.
So let me explain to you what FAIR is going to look like. When you come to this class, always have a question. Always. Just in case we are bankrupt, where other people are not asking questions, you have a question. Come to this class without having any assumptions, any opinions. You're only 18. And I don't even care if you've had a lot of life experiences. You don't have the tools to process them well. Go back to the question on Thursday. Abandonment. It's like giving an infant a steak. But an infant doesn't have teeth. He or she can't chew. It gets stuck. It is true that life has given you a stake, it's just at the wrong time in your life. And no one is going to be able to bring that stake out of your throat. It's stuck there for life. And if you don't find a way to somehow get rid of it, it's going to impact every single relationship that comes into your life. Every one of them. So, what is fair is this. I have something to give you. You don't know what it is. You have zero to give me except your questions. And even the questions that you give me, you will not understand your own questions. When you say, how should I deal with my parents? You don't really understand the question. Why? You're not a parent. You don't know what parents go through. The question is nice. It's a great question. You're missing a lot of pieces in the way of understanding the question. Just ask the question, have no assumptions about it. Don't pretend as if you have the answer to them, you don't. Next is, you have to let me think for you. Now, the way this is going to work is, I have to present this idea in a way that's going to, to some extent, jolt you out of your comfort zone to shock your system a little. That's going to stay with you the rest of the day. Because what's going to happen, if I'm just going to just say things that are going to please you, that will reaffirm who you are in this tiny little box you've created for yourself, I haven't really done anything. My job is to take you out of this ridiculous comfort zone you have created for yourself, shock you. So when you leave the class, the ideas in this class play and replay in your mind. And you know what happens when they get played and replayed? I begin to live inside you. And then what's going to happen is this is the you, this is Amir inside you. Now this is going to be a battlefield. And you know what you're going to do because Amir is brand new inside you? You're going to try your best to remove Amir from your inside. Why? He doesn't leave you alone. He pushes you to examine, to ask, to not have with your friends, to not smile as much, to be serious, to be heavy. And you don't like that. Your friends don't like that about you. 